So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second event in the thought leadership series, Pebble in a Pond, where we discuss difficult topics in the realm of healthcare with a group of highly accomplished disruptors in this field. Uh, today, we will be discussing on the topic, have nursing leaders failed their sisters? There is no doubt that India overcoming the effect of the pandemic were largely due to the strength and determination of the nursing force and their unparalleled sacrifices. The resilience shown by the members of this profession during these extremely difficult times must be acknowledged in very strong terms. However, the several systemic challenges that still exist within this profession have to be addressed. And to set the context on the significant subject, please allow me to introduce Dr. Rangana Sharma, a veteran in healthcare delivery, someone who is extremely passionate about seeing Indian nurses empowered and the director and founding member of Medium Healthcare. Thank you, Harini. So, uh, my respected and esteemed colleagues of the profession, a very good evening to all of you. We have been waiting for this event for a very, very long time, and it has been a cherished dream for Medium Healthcare to initiate a dialogue on this subject. And Mr. Jalan has at long last made it happen today. It is a great, great privilege to have the leaders of the nursing community on this panel to discuss the future, future of this noble profession. When it comes to nursing in India, education, the work environment, the respect and dignity given to the profession and the career progression has been spoken of for many years, but it has been quite stagnant and hasn't seen much action. The exodus of nurses to other countries is not just for monetary reasons alone. It also includes the fact that they are better respected and are offered a better quality of work life, which in turn helps to boost their own self-esteem. Personally, over my career of 40 plus years, I've had some of the greatest professional relationships and friendships with nursing colleagues and I continue to reach out to them whenever I'm in need. And they always manage to help me out. I'm very glad that uh, quite a few of them are in the audience today. While the whole world knows, that is the nurses who manage 75% of the care given in any ICU, OT or wards of any hospital, the, in the hospital industry per se has only given lip service to their, their uh, service without taking any further action in making those words a reality, especially when it comes to salaries, work environment, career progression, recognition, and so on. Who better than the panel we have here to discuss the problems that ail the profession? Today's event is just a stepping stone with the help of some of the world's most steadfast and courageous nursing leaders. We do hope that this discussion and the ripples it makes moves the needle on this crucial subject and instigates change for the better. Thank you and I welcome you all to this uh, panel and to this nursing seminar today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rangana. Um, in order to start this session, we have with us Dr. Kelly Hancock from the Cleveland Clinic to share her experiences and journey as a nursing leader. Dr. Kelly herself is a veteran in nursing and has been recognized for leading, developing, and um, uh, implementing nursing on a global level. Previously, Cle Kelly was the chief uh, nursing officer at Cleveland Clinic and looked over 30,000 uh, nursing staff. Um, after which she got promoted to be the chief caregiving officer, where apart from nursing, she also looks after all aspects of caregiving engagement um, with 70,000 of Cleveland Clinic's engage, uh, caregiving staff. Dr. Hancock was also awarded Crane's Cleveland Business Notable Women in Healthcare Award in 2018, the Soons Folvaro Award for Excellence in Nursing Collaboration in 2017. And apart from this, she's also the recipient of the ANCC Circle of Excellence Award and the Maria and Sam Miller Professional Excellence Nursing Award uh, during her illustrious career. So with that incredible introduction, please allow me to welcome Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for the warm introduction. And it's an honor to be here. And hello to everyone on the call. Um, I'm honored to join you today. And I offer my sincerest thanks to Rattan and Medium Healthcare Consulting for organizing this panel discussion and for asking me to be part of such this important event. Today's panelists, while I don't know them personally, 
have reputations of excellence and leadership. And I was just sharing that with them before we began the call. And I am truly humbled to have the opportunity to speak with you for a few minutes before we hear from these esteemed nurse leaders. I wanted to begin today with a brief overview of the Cleveland Clinic for those of you who are not familiar with the clinic. As you may know, Cleveland Clinic is a global health system. It is based in Cleveland, Ohio, and has locations in Abu Dhabi, London, Canada, and throughout the United States, from Las Vegas to Florida, and across the state of Ohio. This year, Cleveland Clinic is celebrating its centennial anniversary, which is very exciting for us, particularly during this pandemic. We needed this lift. Um, our organization was founded in 1921 by four renowned physicians, and their vision at the time was providing outstanding patient care rooted in principles of cooperation, compassion, and innovation. Throughout our 100 years, Cleveland Clinic has pioneered many medical breakthroughs, including the coronary artery bypass surgery and the first face transplant in the United States. You, we employ more than 70,000 uh, employees, which in our organization, we refer to them as caregivers worldwide. So we have 70,000 caregivers across our global healthcare organization. More than 4,600 are salaried physicians and researchers. More than 19,000 are registered nurses and advanced practice providers with nearly 30,000 nursing caregivers in total. Our clinicians represent 140 medical specialties and subspecialties. In 2020, uh, just to give you some background about how many patients we serve across our system, Cleveland Clinic had 8.7 million outpatient visits, uh, 273,000 hospital admissions and observations, and about 217,000 surgical cases were performed. Patients came from treatment from every state in the United States and from 185 countries. And I thought it'd be helpful uh, before I go into my discussion about my journey, just to give you some interesting statistics about our caregivers. Um, so 75% of our caregivers are female, 27% uh, are minorities, and the average caregiver has nine years of service in our organization. We have roughly about 3,400 leaders who work within our system at a variety of different levels. 62% of those leaders are female and 15% are minorities. Uh, nursing has always been an important part of Cleveland Clinic. And our organization's history as nurses have made significant contributions to clinical operations, professional practice, patient care, of course, and the overall advancement of healthcare. Back in 2008, uh, under Dr. Toby Cosgrove at the time, who was our CEO and president, Cleveland Clinic adopted the Institute model of care. So every clinical um, service line was put into an Institute model. So for example, Heart and Vascular Institute. So all care related to that came in together as a Institute or cancer care. And um, nursing really was one among the first and the largest group to integrate within the health system to become the nursing institute. So nursing has been organized under one umbrella. And that integration brought um, all components of nursing together as one unified organization across our system. And we formed the Stanley Shalom Zaloni Institute for Nursing Excellence in 2009. And it was a huge undertaking and we spent the decade that followed carving a new path for nursing at Cleveland Clinic. And as a side note for some of you, if you have any interest, we are releasing a, a book later this year called Celebrating a Century of Nursing Excellence Without Whose Aid, and it's gonna be our third edition. And we're really excited about this because it really illustrates our work in this past 10 years. So this book shares unique details of how we became one nursing organization and how forming the Nursing Institute really marked an integral turning point for the future at Cleveland Clinic for nursing. It covers the evolution of our team-based approach to care delivery, our strategic planning efforts, how nursing rightfully earned a seat at the table within our health system, 
and the strides that we've made as professional nurses in areas such as nursing innovation, nursing research, nursing education, and nursing technology. The book closes with a glimpse of what nursing has been like at Cleveland Clinic during this global pandemic, which has certainly been a time unlike any other, and I know you all can share the same. These past 18, 19 months have been incredibly challenged for all of us in healthcare, and they continue to be. The most pressing issue right now, as it is in India and almost everywhere across the globe, is staffing. Uh, supply is low and demand is high. The World Health Organization assesses a global supply gap of more than 15 million healthcare workers. And in the United States, the US News and World Report recently published the 100 most in demand jobs in 2021, of which 50% are healthcare jobs. At the same time, the skills and the capabilities caregivers need are changing too fast for traditional hiring or training to keep up with that. So across the board, healthcare organizations are struggling to ensure that they have the workforce necessary to meet their goals and patient care needs. At Cleveland Clinic, we're doing a lot of work right now to engage our different, our, our current nursing staff. Something our nurse managers who are the leaders of our units and our clinics, they're the frontline leaders, they're really focused on bringing teams back together and supporting of caregiver needs. They're holding one-on-one -on -one stay interviews with each of the teams and individual nurses to really listen to nurses' concerns, acknowledge those concerns, and talk through different solutions or support gaps. They are also assessing our nurses' current feelings about their jobs, about the teams that they work with and the overall in, within our organization. They ask questions like, this past year, what projects or work really energize you? So these are some of the questions and dialogue they're having on these one-on-one -on -one stay interviews. They ask them, what are you passionate about? Are there specific recognition efforts that have made you feel valued or that you like to see implemented? Um, they ask the question, what keeps you here? What makes for a great day for you at work? They also ask things in terms of their career. Are there career goals that we haven't discussed or supported you as an organization? Do you feel supported in the goals that you've identified? And then lastly, are we fully utilizing your talents? Or is there anything else that we could do more of or less of? And it's important to pause and do those state interviews to get the feedback, obviously, so we can retain and they could be ambassadors to recruit not only into our organization, but people who are thinking about the profession of nursing. And all around, it's just been an incredibly challenging time in healthcare, and particularly in nursing with this national shortage. Um, as nurse leaders in India, I know that you and your teams are facing these challenges as well and, and more. And each day requires incredibly strong nursing leadership, which is what I want to talk to you about today. I'm a firm believer that strong leaders are the core component to any healthcare organization's ability to succeed and really prosper. During this pandemic, I've seen nurse leaders dig deeper than ever before, giving so much of themselves through the heartache and hardship, yet they prevail. And it's been such a testament of the fact that even in times of great adversity, good leaders will continue to shine. Good nurse leaders have an undeniable passion for doing what they do because to be best leaders in nursing, nursing isn't about what they do, it's about being a part of who they are. This passion motivates us. My own passion for nursing began long ago as I watched a diligent medical team um, over time care for my father who battled cardiac disease. Then and there I knew nursing was my calling. That's when I knew the profession of nursing was for me. I too wanted to make a difference and positively impact the lives of others. I've been a nurse now for roughly 30 years and all at the Cleveland Clinic. I've had a fortunate opportunity and I've spent uh, more than 20 of those years in a leadership position. So I'll take a quick moment and give you a little insight into my career journey. My first, my very first position um, at the Cleveland Clinic was what was called a nurse associate which is a role that I held in, uh, while I finished nursing school. 
and you were doing an internship with a nurse during your last year. So after I earned my bachelor's degree from the Brain School of Nursing um, at Ursuline College here, I spent three years um, as a staff nurse in my chosen clinical specialty, which was of course cardiovascular nursing. I then assumed the role of a clinical coordinator, which is very similar to an assistant nurse manager for two cardiothoracic step-down units at that time. So about 72 beds, those patients had post-open heart uh, surgery. And then later on, um, a few years down the line, I became the nurse manager of those two units. I held that nurse manager role, the frontline leader, which I would argue is probably one of the most challenging roles um, in nursing um, for about five years. And it was at that point where my leadership trajectory was really set in motion. I moved then on into a nursing director position within Cleveland Clinic's uh, renowned Heart and Vascular and Thoracic Institute. Um, so I served in that capacity, um, overseeing the number one heart center in the country for about nine years. And then after that, followed by uh, serving our organization, I had the privilege as the chief nursing officer for Cleveland Clinic's main campus. And then less than a year later, um, I was asked to consider being the system chief nursing officer in 2012, and I was named the health system's executive uh, chief nursing officer. So after almost a decade of being the system chief nursing officer at Cleveland Clinic, last year, uh, Dr. Mihalovich, who is now our CEO and president, asked me to consider being Cleveland Clinic's first ever chief caregiver officer. So as I mentioned, all of our employees, all 70,000 are called caregivers in our organization. And this position, um, again, oversees our global employees, our caregivers under a newly formed caregiver office. And it's been quite a ride, um, let me tell you, um, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's really been rewarding and has allowed me to grow, continue to grow professionally as a leader. And as I've progressed in my career, I've been privileged to learn from some of the best leaders in healthcare. Some of my path into leadership was of natural progression, but really the rest was ambition and really heeding the advice and guidance of those who've walked uh, in my shoes and who would see my potential even when I couldn't. And I was really encouraged by many mentors and um, leaders in our organization and outside of our organization. So throughout these early years of my career, especially, I remember taking advantage of any opportunity that was in place in front of me. So remember, I assumed a, a nurse leadership role relatively young in my nursing career. So at that point, I wanted to ensure that I served uh, the, those in well, the organization well. So I took advantage of any opportunity that was placed in front of me. I grabbed every chance I could to be mentored uh, by people within the organization, outside the organization, some were nurses, some were other leaders, just to get some experience in different leadership competencies, capabilities, how you manage situations. Um, I took on stretch assignments when they're available. Um, I would raise my hand. I was always attending growth and development courses and conferences. Early on, I made a personal commitment to never stop learning. And another trait of a strong leader um, that served, at least it served me well, I pushed myself to higher education. So later on um, in my professional career, I earned my master's in nursing and then eventually my doctorate degree in nursing practice. And I'm extremely grateful for the opportunities that I've been given and I feel blessed. And I know the same opportunities I've had are unfortunately not always available elsewhere. In India, I've learned that sadly opportunities for advanced or perhaps specialized nurse training, as well as mentoring or nurturing for future growth are far less than ideal. And I think that's why we're here today. And as these challenges and others are, are what brings us together today, as I mentioned, and I'd like to point out that another highly important trait of a strong nurse leader is that we are change agents. And I am confident that with exceptional leaders like yourselves at the helm, needed change can and will be achieved. It's hard and, and often takes longer than we would like, but it can be done even against the hurdles and the forces that are working against us. When I became the executive chief nursing officer, I faced one of the biggest challenges of my career, which was really 
uniting thousands of Cleveland Clinic nursing caregivers across the globe into one cohesive nursing organization. And to be honest, when I stepped into this position, um, no criticism to those um, who came before me, but it just wasn't organized together and the operations were inefficient. Uh, the nurse leader structure was incomplete. Uh, everybody had different titles, caregiver support uh, was a, um, fragmented, if you will. Engagement and morale were lower than what we desired and had hoped for the Cleveland Clinic. So what I began to do is started my work by building a nursing leadership team um, of known change agents in different specialty areas and began outlining strategies to improve the operations, build trust, and really address the challenges nursing caregivers are facing. To move the needle forward, I focused on an operationalizing a governance model. And that governance model would effectively bring all the pieces of nursing together in a way that was best suited for our health system. It was a huge change um, for our decade old organization. And there was some resistance as you can imagine because nursing was having a seat at the table. But I also knew that for the integration to succeed, the nursing institute needed to become a more prominent, respected and valued component of our health system. We had to change the old ways of doing things and we had to change the perception of nurses. Um, to better establish the organizational value of the Institute and our nurses, the nursing profession needed more representation throughout our health system. So I really drove, and these are my terms, the fight to give nursing a seat at the decision-making table. I ended up earning a well-respected position within the health system leadership team and started reporting to the executive board um, of our organization and how Nursing Institute was helping Cleveland Clinic achieve, and in many cases, exceed our financial, our operational, and our clinical goals. Soon, uh, the other members of our executive nursing team also began growing their partnerships and collaborations with other Cleveland Clinic executives and organizational leaders. And this presence really gained our team a reputation of excellence and an admired respect from our colleagues. We showed that our nursing leaders were influential, they were agile, they were resilient, and they were poised to tackle the obstacles and challenges of healthcare, and that we brought added value to the health system, and that patients and communities we serve also gained by that. Getting back to the point of uh, required, getting to that point required elevated, ongoing, and consistent communication. That was key. Communication, and I mean communication like we've never done before in nursing, which to me is another thing required of a strong nurse leader, including informal nurse leaders on our, on our units. I'll take you back for a minute to the days when I was um, a new nurse practicing. At that time, the structure of our traditional healthcare teams lacked interdisciplinary communication and collaboration, oftentimes between nurses and our physician colleagues. So on behalf of my patients, I made it a priority to speak up and directly communicate with my care team colleagues, sharing my ideas, my thoughts, my opinions on the assessments, so forth, and what I felt was best for my patients and their families. It was the first step of a career long effort I've made to promote interdisciplinary collaboration, the importance of teamwork and communication. By advocating for the nursing profession, and the imperative role of the nurse in delivering safe, high quality health care. I was giving myself and my nurse colleagues a really a voice in decision making and a voice in the processes in, in terms of that decision making and patient care practices, where sometimes we often didn't have that voice. I've carried this need um, to establish and execute ongoing consistent and transparent communication throughout my career as a leader. And I think that is important. Clearly that's one of the lessons that I've learned early on. And then flashing forward to the first days, weeks and months of the pandemic, clearly the decision-making was rapid as you all know, as the evidence continued to change, we learned more about the pandemic, what was really happening and transparent and real-time communication with caregivers at least in our organization, and I know probably in many of yours, was essential. There was a lot of anxiety, a lot of emotion. They didn't know what was going on. So the importance of that communication really played out um, 
during the pandemic and our caregivers told us that facing the risk of infection, virus surges, supply shortages, staffing shortages, um, major disruptions, particularly early on in day-to-day -day practice and process. We know the physical and emotional um, stress that played. Um, like all of you, I was looking at my team and how can I carry them through this? And again, going back to communication, it was vital and it was my uh, in my ability to do so, which I think is so imperative. It was interesting because oftentimes we would pause and just have communication with one another and, and check-ins to ensure that we were doing okay. I wanted to make sure my leaders were doing okay. And our leadership teams communicated around the clock. I know just like many of you do. The executive nurse leaders were present on all system-wide executive phone briefings. They were in the incident command briefings. At least two nursing specific emails update communications were sent to our nursing leadership team every day, sharing with our caregivers. And then we ended uh, early on in the pandemic with a daily phone meeting, which was held at 5 p.m. Within an hour of all the team nurse leader meetings, an executive debrief and a summary com was completed and included action items and deliverables. And again, that was distributed to all who were in attendance. So not only were they participating in the calls, giving their feedback, communicating, but we wanted to close the loop and follow up with those action items, what we committed to, and again, making sure that it was sent out by email or, or however they wanted it. Myself and other nurse leaders formed partnerships with other leaders from other health corps organizations, which was really incredible how we united together as um, different healthcare leaders and providers. And we did, we worked too with our state and our local officials, and we made caregiver and patient safety our top priority despite our location. And as part of our care philosophy, um, I'm just gonna share with you a little bit that Dr. Mihalovich has brought. And he brought forward in his tenure, which he's been our CEO for about three years now, four care priorities, which we all follow. The first one is to care for our patients, second to care for our caregivers, the third is to care for the organization, and then lastly, to care for the community. So all of our actions align, all of our work align around these four care priorities in our organization. And our leaders led um, with our Cleveland Clinic values, which really brings me to my next point that strong leaders, nurse leaders in particular, need to lead by example. The way, many of you know this, the way that you behave as a leader matters a lot. At Cleveland Clinic, our core values reflect the behaviors that we expect, not only from our leaders, but also from our caregivers. So every day we ask our leaders to lead with these behaviors and to encourage all of our caregivers to do the same. And while these behaviors are very specific to our culture, I think they are good examples of what nursing leaders everywhere should be thinking about to successfully lead their teams in the future. So first, safety and quality. This means ensuring the highest standards and excellent outcomes through effective interactions, that communication that I spoke about, decision-making and other actions. Next, empathy. Imagining what another person is going through, working to alleviate suffering, whether it's for a patient, a family or a coworker. And this is the heart and soul of nursing is empathy as we know. Teamwork. Working together to ensure the best possible care, safety, and well being of our patients and our fellow caregivers. To me, this is a huge um, imperative. Daily, you will hear our, our CEO and president say it takes a team of teams to succeed in our business and, and businesses providing care to our patients. In integrity. Um, adhering to high moral principles and professional standards by a commitment. And that commitment is to being honest, um, to respecting confidentiality, having established trust, respect, and being transparent. Each of these are an absolute must for strong, effective nursing leadership. Next would be inclusion. What I mean by inclusion is about being intentional, intentionally creating an environment of compassionate belonging, where all are valued, all members of the team are valued and they're respected. Reiterating the fact that every voice matters. 
Every member of the team makes a difference and their voice matters. And then finally, I would say innovation, driving small and large changes to transform healthcare everywhere is imperative. And one more point about leadership that I'd like to keep, like you to keep in mind, especially if you are a newer nurse leader, is that effective nurse leadership doesn't come from authority or power, but really it comes from the ability of the leader to empower others. And that's an important point. It's about the influential qualities like passion, inspiration, honesty, confidence, and dependability. It's also about being a great listener, a visionary, and a decision maker, engaging and communicating well, not being afraid of failure and learning from your mistakes. We have all failed at some decisions and we've learned from that and we will continue. That's what makes us strong leaders. And being all in because you wanna make a difference. And that's important, bringing your true best self your authentic leadership in. So you could really make the difference that you set out to be in healthcare and as your selection as a leader. My last piece of advice before the panel discussion begins is always to remember that as a leader, compassion and, and, compassion and grace go a long way. Don't be too hard on yourself and take the time to recognize your successes. There are many, no matter how big or small they are. It'll definitely help keep you grounded and will offer a pleasant reminder of what you do, of why you do what you do. Thank you very much for this morning. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. That was incredible. In terms of highlighting the pillars of leadership for nurses to follow from empathy to integrity to innovation, and the importance of compassion and grace, I think you've kind of encompassed um, what many young aspiring nursing leaders look up to and would be listening to us here today about. So thank you again for your inputs and uh, taking us through your journey as a nursing leader. Thank you, it's an honor. Um, I now would like to welcome our esteemed panel to kickstart this much awaited session. Before I introduce our nursing leaders for the evening, I would like to inform the audience uh, that throughout the session, you are able to write in questions through the question answer window. Um, and in the end of the session, uh, based on the availability of time, we would try to answer as many as possible. Uh, please feel free to direct these questions towards any particular panelist, if you feel free. <clears throat> so now uh, we are fortunate to have with us in this evening, a group of accomplished leaders who in their own right have worked to empower nurses along their career. So let me begin by introductions. Uh, we have with us uh, Ma'am Antonia Pusparaj, who is a show social healthpreneur and specializes in adolescent well-being, apart from being an advisor and specialist in nursing excellence. She's also held leadership positions in Sagar Hospital and HCG Group of Hospitals. We also have Colonel Binu Sharma, who is a senior VP of nursing services at Columbia Asia Hospitals. Colonel Binu has received several awards, including the Nightingale Award for Leadership in Nursing. She's also an advisory panel member for FICCI for nursing, nursing, uh, national nursing programs. Um, we also have Dr. Clara Michael, who is a director of nursing at IHS Healthcare in India, which consists of the Glen Gales Global Group, as well as the Continental Hospitals. Dr. Clara has been awarded the most innovative healthcare leadership award for the year of 2020. We have Dr. Swati Rani, who is the founder and vice president of Clinical Nursing Research Society and the founder and CEO of Seva Shakti Healthcare Consultancy. Dr. Swati is a healthcare strategist and an activist who strongly, strongly advocates for nursing rights. Um, we have Dr. Captain Usha Banerjee, who's the group director of nursing at Apollo Hospitals. She's received the Pre President's Award and the National Women Excellence Award and is an active member of many task forces in the country. Finally, we have with us Mr. Ratan Jalan, who is the founder and managing director of Medium Healthcare. This evening, he will be the moderator for the session. Thank you, thank you, Harini, and uh, and uh, welcome to the exciting panel discussion. And uh, thank, let me thank all of you for finding time uh, on the Saturday evening. Uh, we are privileged to have uh, uh, Kelly Hancock. I mean, I mean, who uh, who is the chief caregiver officer at an iconic institution like like the Cleveland Clinic, and for her to share. 
uh, not just her journey, but uh, but how nursing is an important uh, differentiator, if I may say, and makes Cleveland Clinic what it is. So thanks once again, uh, Kelly. And we have uh, uh, an esteemed panel, I think some of the most well-respected uh, uh, nursing leaders in the country. Honestly, uh, my only qualification is that in the last 25 years or so, I've been in healthcare and I've had opportunities to observe the nursing profession very closely uh, as a colleague at times, as a, as a consultant, as a patient myself, as a caregiver when somebody close in the family had been admitted to a hospital and even as a member of the society. So, so I think, uh, I mean, that's what got me quite, uh, let's say, passionate and at times, uh, let's say, really disturbed about, if I may say, the state of affairs when it comes to nursing. And before I begin, uh, let me share that uh, of the folks who had registered, we had tried to conduct a simple survey. And uh, we had 70 odd responses to the survey. And... Uh, and less than half of the people who responded believe that nursing leaders have collectively failed. I mean, less than half of them think that, which I think is a good news. In fact, uh, one of them went on to the extent of saying that if we had more nursing leaders of the kind which are there on the panel, the world would they in a different place as far as nurses are concerned. So I think I must I must compliment you all for for, for inspiring uh, you know such such young people. Now, based on my understanding and and some of the research me and my colleagues have done on nursing, uh, I have I have a I have a few questions, and uh, what I would do is that I will address these questions to one or two of you, not all of you, just to avoid the, uh, the unnecessary overlap, if, if I may say. So let me begin with the first question. And that, that what is it a good nursing leader focus on? Or what is it he or she should, should aim to achieve? And let me, let me begin with Usha. Uh, well, Mr. Jalan, uh, the other dignitaries, uh, members of the medium healthcare consulting, and my esteemed panelists, and many more who are listening to us uh, off the panel. Uh, Mr. Jalan, first of all, I must tell you that uh, this panel has been uh, given a lot of publicity, and it has probably grabbed a lot of eyeballs. And it has set us pondering and thinking, because it's a very, very provocative title for the panel. Interesting. Uh, the second thing I would like to say before even I come to answering your question is, sisters, I know many of them in the country probably do not like to be addressed as sisters because they like to be like any other professionals, Mr., Ms., Sir, Ma'am, Doctor, Army titles, honorary titles, or simply by their name. And I'm glad we're going to have some candid conversations. And I'm here to defend what I say based on my experience, my learning, my opportunities. And I'm not here to offend anyone. So that's my disclaimer. While we all know what we are here to deliver or achieve, and I think each of us know our goals. We know what our job responsibilities are. I think for me, what is important here is to understand that this is an epic moment. We are here at an inflection point. We are witnessing unprecedented change and disruptive innovations. What we must aim to do is to inspire our nurses and our nursing workforce and embrace change by fostering a culture of accountability, ownership, and workplace autonomy. That's my firm belief. While we balance transparencies, the very ethos of our profession and set different types of boundaries so that we foster experimentation and collaboration. For me, I think it is important that the aim should be to encourage risk-taking 
innovation, and deliver with value, ethics, integrity, both for the people we lead and for the profession at large. And it is important for us to balance these hard truths with optimism, though there is a lot of negativity around the whole nursing profession today. We need to act decisively. We need to endure setbacks while maintaining the ability to navigate our way through the various changes, turn our potential into success, and develop resilience and navigate these bumpy transitions because we're going to have a great future tomorrow. We need to embrace the industry disruption and disrupt from within. We need to remain irresistibly superior by values and not by position. And we can bring this entire diverse group of people together and show that a nurse matters, our voice matters. We are delivering great outcomes. Now it is important for us to deliver for the larger good of the profession. That's my take, Mr. Jalan. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Clara, what would be your take? What is it which a nursing leader should focus on? You're, you're on mute. Thanks, Mr. Jalan. I'm glad I'm here today. And I can see a lot of nursing leaders joining hands with us, encouraging us, and also motivating us so that we are able to share our thoughts. Nursing is passion to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have chosen this profession in my young age when I had an opportunity to become a doctor and a dentist. So I take a pride that I am a nurse and I'm proud and I keep telling this always. Thanks to Kelly for all those wonderful journey that she has shared with us. And Usha, thanks. You had set the ground well. I think I need not touch point on sister's point and uh, brother's point. So to start answering my question, I just thought through what uh, the question is all about. A good leader aim to achieve and deliver. So it is delivering and then achieving or you keep achieving and then keep on delivering. It's not only us, we take the battalion with us so that all of us together deliver and achieve. I've got five important aspects that I would like to share here under this particular question. One being pride, bring pride to nurses and the nursing profession and inspire nurses to be proud of what they contribute to delight patients and who they are in the healthcare. This is very important point. People should know who nurses are in the healthcare. And I'm sure pandemic has revealed it very well. We should sustain it and take it onward and then show the world that nurses, not only in Western world, but in India are highly capable. The second point I would like to present here is assure to the larger population of India that the nursing is the most trusted, respected, and valued profession. So this is a great challenge. And day in and day out, this is a dream. This is a passion for every leader who's here, who's connected here, who is not connected here, who's toiling across India in all the hospitals. The third point that I would like to present here is on create a strong next generation. Pave path for nursing leaders of tomorrow. How do we do it? Share responsibilities. Allow them to step in and develop. Allowing them to step in is very difficult. Offer your chair so they will experience it. They'll commit errors, but they will keep growing. So this is one aspect I would like to stress upon as a third point. The fourth one is influence decision makers to position nurses rightly. May it be hospital organogram or any institutions or universities or a 
epics bodies or government official system anywhere we have to position nurses rightly this is a great challenge in all developing countries and i'm sure it's a challenge in western world as well we have to fight a way out the last point i would like to stress here to say that nursing leaders aim to achieve and deliver is coach mid level leaders leaders for tomorrow nursing now has made us very clear that we have to coach leaders and mid level leaders are tomorrow leaders for us and basically we have to put in strategies and balance nurses satisfaction and patient satisfaction always is this skewed many times we focus on patient but we don't focus on the caregivers or we focus on the caregivers more and then we miss the patient satisfaction so it is important to coach them so that there is a very clear balance between the patient satisfaction and nurses satisfaction these are the five points i would like to place to say that good leaders aim to achieve and deliver thank you thank you thank you clara and thank you usha so usha spoke about Uh, innovation accountability uh, the need to stay optimistic and she spoke about resilience and integrity and i think these are very uh, insightful or uh, very valuable uh, pillars if i may say and and clara spoke about passion and she spoke about pride she spoke about trust but i think uh, very beautifully she said that as a nurse leader you should be more than eager to offer your chair so uh, so i'm just saying as a nurse leader it is our responsibility to create a future let's say chain if i may say or network or supply of nursing leaders so thank you so much now coming to the second question see in your experience all of you would have come across nursing leaders in different uh, organizations or different levels within your own organization who make you feel good you also come across people who kind of get you worried so the question is and and i'm going to ask this question to antonia that in your opinion what does it take to be a strong nursing leader antonia Good evening Mr Jalan and my co-panelists and all the participants. Thank you so much for this honorable and privileged platform to express my views on nursing. As everyone said that they wanted to be a nurse so they embraced nursing. My story is different. I did not want to be a nurse whatever maybe but I never wanted to embrace nursing. but after walking 27 years something within nursing inspires me to continue um in nursing domain maybe now within the community given the opportunity to serve in the hospital of various capacities not only in nursing also in education practice research administration and community which i embrace very uh, dearly now as a social health pioneer in the adolescent well being i believe leaders are not born they are made nursing being the second oldest profession in the world it really did pave path for all of us our nurse leaders for example the founder of modern nursing florence nightingale her path was not so easy as kelly said leading by setting example is the best leadership style a nurse leader can embrace in my experience and opinion i believe there are very unique attributes in addition to other leadership domains also in nursing i feel the foundation of integrity civic mindedness ethics to adapt use teach support and foster professional 
care delivery system that is what makes the difference. The second thing is emotional intelligence. It is not what we know, but how we deliver. That is what it is important. How we communicate may be important, but the tone, the words what we use, that makes all the difference. Critical thinking is very important because though nursing in India, we say we are autonomous, but in reality, we work as auxiliary to medical profession. So this pseudo autonomy, which we are experiencing, the critical thinking to implement the care modules on a patient as a case manager at the bedside, while collaborating your activities with the multidisciplinary team through collaboration, it is a challenge. Hence, the nurse leader needs to set an example for her followers to embrace this value of critical thinking. Dedication to excellence, as a famous Greek philosopher said, excellence is nothing but you do a right thing. It becomes a habit. When habit is repeated, it becomes excellence. Quality and dedication to excellence is an important core of nursing leadership because excellence demands you to be very resilient, agile, handle difficult situation, communicate very uh, troubling or sort of like challenging communication to your team members and your authorities and also subordinates, get things done. Communication skills. Communication is not just how we communicate, but the difficult communication. Uh, the difficult communication, for example, a nurse, maybe she has to break a bad news or maybe a disaster handling, or when error happens, how a nurse leader can be very understanding, very much understanding and empathic towards her team members. That is what also makes very uh, important and communicating with different age groups and also sensory deficit patient is another thing. Professional socialization, because though pandemic has put us into our compartmentalized world, but nurse can pave path and she goes beyond those silos. So we need to have professional networks and professional socialization, not only with nursing, but various other organization. In community, we call it as multi-sectoral approach, respect, mentorship, professionalism. And as our co-panelists said that, self-awareness and prioritizing our personal development, it is very important. For me, I always believed by creating more leaders, we create a better atmosphere for nursing. A true leader will always use her or his ability and hands to lift others and they create more leaders. And also with this pandemic situation and apart from that when the universe is becoming, a nursing is becoming a global community. So cross-cultural communication and inclusion and gender equality, which need to be uh, embraced by nursing. So I think if a nurse leader embraces all these things, she is on the way of becoming a great leader and set an example for her followers. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Antonia. And uh, we know, uh, in your opinion, what does it take to be a strong nursing leader? Thank you, Mr. Jalan. Uh, thank you, colleagues and friends. Already my colleagues have set the tone so for me, I, I would just say a strong human being, a stronger woman will always make a strong nurse leader too. When I came into nursing, it was not in my arena of careers. I was doing my statistics honors from Delhi University, walked out of that and joined military nursing, assuming, perceiving and thinking that I have joined a profession where I will be able to exercise my, my ability to speak and my strong personality, which I thought I had it since the very beginning. In my opinion, a strong nursing leader is somebody who is a role model, 
So leaders, as Antonia said, are not born, but they get developed over time. I would say it's a mix of both. You have certain traits in you when you're born and other traits you develop over time. So somebody who is a role model, who can inspire not just the nursing team, but inspire other professionals in her healthcare setup. Somebody who has great emotional quotient, the EQ, who can handle stress, anxiety, not just for herself and the nurses, but for so many other people working in the healthcare system. Why I would say that working as a nurse leader for over 40 years, I've had young doctors, customer care, paramedics, uh, many people coming to me for support. So you need to be able to have the uh, mental strength and resilience to, to help others. You need to have excellent and outstanding communication skills. You need to be able to navigate through all the challenges which crop up in hundreds every single day. I think a nurse leader should also be somebody who's fearless, who can speak the right thing at the right time when required without fear of losing her chair. You know, once you get a chair, a designation, everything is so important. You probably you have fear of losing the chair when you stand up to the senior leadership of the organization. If it is a strong leader, you stand up for the right cause, you are honest, you are upfront, you are truthful, your integrity and ethics are in order, and you are able to bring a change, you can command respect, you will make a strong leader, and many of the people, rather all of the people on this panel are very, very strong nurse leaders, and there are many more in our country. So this is what, in my opinion, makes a strong nurse leader. Thank you. Thank you so much, Binu. So we spoke about uh, leading by example. We spoke about integrity. We spoke about emotional intelligence, critical thinking. And, uh, and, and you said that strong communication skills and uh, a certain degree of fearlessness. I mean, that, that's what it takes to be a strong nursing leader. Now, coming to some of the ground realities, as we know, uh, at least in the Indian context, when it comes to the role of a typical nurse, and that has been my observation, there is so much coordination. It is, whether you talk about pharmacy, you talk about food services, doctors, transport, housekeeping, billing, it's, I think it is coordination and coordination and coordination. Then you have documentation, and then you have direct patient care. I'm just saying that we kind of think that the role they get to perform actually do very little justice to their clinical knowledge or the competence. I mean, they are they are expected to execute a doctor's orders. So I think my question and and. I'll, I'll come to Binu, uh, I mean, you yourself, that how common you think is this phenomenon? Why do you think it is happening? And how have you been able to address uh, this issue? So, uh, very, very uh, ground reality for nurses. They are supposed to be super human beings, super men and super women. As you said, the number of activities they require to do as the youngest fresh graduate straight out of the college, at every single level, a team leader, a supervisor, a manager, and right up to the nurse leader of the hospital, they need to be superhuman beings. And also in our country, although they take care of so many activities, they are still supposed to be following the clinician's order. Although I would say the new generation of nurses is changing that uh, to, our, to our pleasing uh, pleasing ears and eyes, they, they want to stand up, they want to question the doctors, they want to question the, the medications, the dosage, the, the tubes, the catheters, why it can't be taken out, clinical decision making. They want to question when they are straight out of the college. Over time, what happens? 
And here I would say the fault lies to an extent with us as nurse leaders. We try to tame them. And why do we try to tame them? It is because we want an easy, smooth functioning in the hospital. We do not want conflicts with the doctors. We do not want controversies. We do not want to be answerable to a director of cardiothoracic. We do not want to be answerable to the CEO of the hospital, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We do not want to walk up why a nurse did not follow the doctor's order. Why did she question him for hand washing? Why did she question him? for a IV cannula to be removed or a urinary catheter to be removed, et cetera. So I would say in my experience, I have been able to break many of those barriers. One is by training your team adequately and appropriately. Knowledge and skills are par for nursing. If they are trained well, if they have the knowledge, they have the skills and they've been able to update themselves with the national and international guidelines, they will be able to question, although I would still say questioning a doctor, they do not have to be rude or, or hurt their fragile egos, so per se, but they can put across their point and get through to it. And I have seen that in my experience in the, in the corporate for about 21 years and in the Indian Army for another 22 years, Doctors don't take an offense if the nurse is speaking the right thing. But the nurse has to have the ability, the knowledge, and the right communication skills to put across her point, and they will sail through. This is what has worked for me, I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and uh, Laura, what is your take on this? The role so, uh, which the answer to your question is should nurses follow doctor's order? Legal requirement for nursing is we have to follow doctor's order. But then, can they follow it blindly? Then we should say no because we don't stand for our strong professionalism. So, nurses' accountability actually is to follow doctor's order, but validate it and then execute it. If at all they found it to be not appropriate, they have to clarify and recommend for change. If they do that, then they are doing justice for nursing profession while still adhering to the legal requirements of doctor's order for life. Very few nurses are able to do it. Some of them are not able to do it. Now we'll see what is the reason. The reason is internal to nursing and external to nursing. When we say internal to nursing, some of the nurses are less competent, so they are not confident. They are not powerful at the bedside and not able to stand up or speak up. So they blindly have to follow. And they, their understanding of the rational behind why they are doing is not there. They just blindly follow. The other type of nurses are very competent. They know the rational behind, and, but they are not empowered or encouraged. They are forced to follow instruction of the doctor. So what happens? Burn up and they leave us. There is another category of nurses who are still confident, competent to do it. There are very good clinicians who are supporting them, where nurses are partnering with them, even to the level of diagnosing, even they partake with curing. So those nurses flourish and grow to the next level. So that, this is a pattern we could see across in many hospitals. Now, how do we address it? For addressing this, we have four points. Point number one is we have to have competency level of nurses to be assessed at the entry level and keep on assessing it so that they are privileged to perform at the highest level of competency of both basic and advanced skills. Second, we have to address professional egos. Professional egos does not only exist with doctors or other professionals, it also exists in nursing. Some of our senior colleagues are also very egoistic. So we have to break that. May, they may be working as a mid-level leaders in, in the units, or they may be a senior nurses. They do have egos. Hand-holding of the younger nurses are not seen. So this has to be explored. We have to also have acknowledgement of competency. How many of the nurses' competency is getting acknowledged at the bedside? Wonderful competencies are there. Stories are there day to day, day in and out. 
these are not registered these are not publicized so i think as leaders we have failed here we have to focus on this the last point is breaking hierarchy for patient care there is no hierarchy whoever is competent who is mindful who steps in to decide the first right decision is the leader so this long way to go in india we have to practice it practice it although it is happening and pandemic has revealed it now how do we go about solving all this one train and upskill right form of nurses right from the student period they have to be taught a sim hospital kind of learning and exposure what their brain has not seen the eyes cannot see hand cannot perform their brain cannot think so it has to happen the second aspect that we leaders are trying to focus and still continue to do is empower to stand up and speak up for patients and let it be role model to the nurses when the nurses stand up and speak up stay with them let them stand in the middle when doctors rounds are happening let the doctors ask them by name can i shift this patient now is the criteria fitting do you think the patient should stay back in the icu for some more hours this should be the conversation between the nurse and the doctor nurturing and learning environment cq and eq are very important curiosity quotient and emotional quotient i don't know like i am thinking through like i have failed to inculcate this in my nurses although sporadically i have done it but this needs a, a strong point that we have to improve curiosity quotient and the um, emotional quotient among the nurses and that will be very good if it starts right from the student period the last but not the least very important team work and involve them in decision making ask although they are not able to make a decision the young nurse at the bedside when it is asked she will think her her answers may not be the right answer but there will be a thought process that will provoke her to think and she will remember that she is a leader who is getting evolved at the bedside these are my answers to the question uh, sir thank you thank you so much so i think what both of you very uh, very emphatically said that the knowledge and skill are the most powerful weapon when it comes to defining a nurse's role act on ground and i think i mean i i think we can't over emphasize that point you spoke about a supportive environment you spoke about an empowering environment and you said that a, 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 a let's say a culture of accountability you spoke about mindfulness and i think and something very nice which you said that that their role their contribution needs to be recognized because that's the only thing which is going to make them feel more and more confident which is important more and more empowered i mean you know, the kind of role they can get to play so thank you so much uh now the, the next question is as in at least in the indian context as we know and uh, you have once in a while you'll have headlines in newspapers the nurses are paid peanuts you know i mean you have nurses who are who get paid less than a plumber or a driver and people talk about nursing as a cost center something which needs to be monitored closely and and reduced for that matter so so my question to to swati is that what why do you think it happens and and what could possibly be done to address this fundamental challenge a very good evening to all it brings my esteemed seniors who are there on the nursing leaders with from whom i have learned my nursing so today i am here because of you all and i'm speaking on behalf of you all with your permission uh with the permission of my teachers and because you all are there uh, fighting at the hospitals and at the communities that is the reason i think uh, today we can manage so much and i thank mr jalan uh, he's uh, 
not only uh, a person who really cares for nursing, but he's my first CEO and my mentor also. Uh, so I thank him for taking uh, such an important social, nursing is a social issue for me. So I thank him for taking this uh, onus of, you know, uh, caring for the community. And uh, now let me uh, thank also the audience for patiently listening to us and standing by us. So the question of nursing salaries is not today's question. It is an age old question, I think. From the time we started our profession, this issue has come. And I think the answer goes to, uh, I, I found it after two years uh, of my activist role as a nurse uh, during COVID. And uh, even the WHO's report, which is there, uh, the, the report itself says that it is the report's name title is Delivered by Women, Led by Me. So you must have got my answer also. So 90% of the healthcare workers are women and most of them are nurses, okay? And uh, the healthcare delivery system, if you redefine it, okay? So women are almost 70% there. Okay, at the workstations, near the bed or near the desk, and the decision makers, or you can call them as senior role leaders, okay, in the healthcare are men. They are not women. So the issue of salaries, I think uh, it is a mindset which we have to change of the patriarchy which is there uh, in the world, that women are uh, the women's work unpaid work, okay? The labor of women is so what, you know? So the, the, the lens which, with what we see women's work has to change. Okay? And for that, I think we women have to stand. So I take a onus whenever I'm on LinkedIn and if I see a panel with only men, or we call it as manals, I will ask the question there, we, don't you have any women uh, in your field? Okay, so I think we all women have to take that onus of questioning this. Okay, so we have to stand for us. So today, if you see the uh, issue of salaries is there, because if you see in the board, okay, of the people who are deciding our salaries, who are they? They are men, okay, 90%. Second, the medical hegemonies. Till now, in the mindset, it is doctors know all. So even when we are when they are giving the salaries or setting the salaries, the doctors would ask me being as a hospital administrator. And when I used to stand by nurses, they would ask, why are you giving so much salary to a nurse? Okay. So then we had to define okay, what uh, the nurse's role is. Okay. And how critical she is, even if she's a student nurse, how she's a leader from the time she stands in front of the patient. Okay. And 24 by 7, the role of nurses is there. So we have to, I think, uh, Colonel Binu has very rightly said that, you know, nursing, she has very nicely made a financial model that how nursing is important as an asset. Okay, So to have asset, you have to invest. So investment in nursing is must. And it is not today that we are talking, but globally it is necessary. If you invest in nursing, you get dividends. Dividends in the form of patient safety, okay, patient's life, mortality rate decreases. So these are all the things I think the mindset needs to be changed on how you see liability and asset. Okay? So the peanut salary is because I think that nurses need to have voice. Whoever Okay, she has to stand for her. And I would request the peers of nursing, uh, uh, nurses uh, in, the, uh, in the executive board, they have to support nurses. That today, 24 by 7 on the shaft floor is a nurse. So if you don't support your colleague, you know, even your job is at stake. So this is what is very much important. And peanut salary, it is really disheartening during COVID times. When I used to get calls from the ground levels that, Madam, we are getting 12,000 rupees salary, fresher, okay? And they are asking me to work 12 hours per hour, even without having an N95 mask. And when I checked myself, my driver, my maid, I'm paying 20,000 rupees for 10 hours. 
okay and that job what they do and what the nurses are doing for 12 uh, 12000 rupees you cannot compare it so i think we are we have exploited nurses enough in india and we have to stop that's it thank you so much and usha what do you think uh, should be done or can be done at a broad industry level to actually address this compensation piece uh well mr jalan uh, it's a cruel irony that uh, has been playing out on the ground that uh, nurses are paid so less today even peanuts are not cheap and better the brand higher the cost and we all have read it in the times of india that uh, on december 5 2019 that nurses are paid two less a salary Uh, much lesser than the plumbers well i think it's important for every profession to be paid what they richly deserve the society is made of not just the higher echelon people we need everybody's service you can't do without a plumber you can't do without a driver and the healthcare system just cannot do without a nurse so i wish and pray that everybody gets due recognition but nurses richly deserve what they deserve and like Uh, Swati said, and I'm so glad I'm sharing this question with her. She's a strong voice for a social cause, and and all of us seated here are great feminists, and we all believe the social minority that comes to play as a large group of nurses has been one of the reasons. And we are a capitalistic country, and uh, we are known for exploitation. I think what's the problem is uh, most of the nurses are from backgrounds where they have very little understanding of the job market or the world per se and india is considered nursing to be a labor oriented function than a professional function and some of these um what do you say job cartels which work like a well oiled machinery have constantly advertised that you are an inexperienced or a fresh nurse so you have to be paid low salaries and many of them accept it because it's a question of livelihood and and many of them also know that they're not here for long to stay and they have great opportunities across the border so probably people are willing to work at a low salary there is a plethora of things that contribute to this and it's like opening up a pandora's box and we could probably have days of discussion on on this subject or on this question but somewhere i feel the profession is also equally responsible and we had our panelists earlier speak about knowledge competence a strong sense of communication understanding the world around you bringing in industry and business perspectives right from the time you're a young nurse at the bedside you don't wait for somebody to come here and take us out of this cog wheel that we are caught in i think nurses are very fortunate that the last decade and a half has seen great leadership in the country unlike ever before there are great stalwarts role models and mentors whom we still look up at who are great voices too so i think there is enough to emulate right from the time you're a young nurse and you step into the profession and there can't be anyone much more responsible to advocate their own profession than the professionals themselves so i think it's important to understand this fragmentation the access problems the unsustainable costs suboptimal outcomes and all that make this higher bureaucracy that we are caught in and this gender based work model which needs a complete hash out once and for all like kelly said everybody is a caregiver right from the janitor to the person sitting on the top nobody has titles so i think how we can come out of this is social reforms policy reforms everybody is responsible everybody needs healthcare you me the top the young the sm- the person at the last end of the food chain needs a hospital service and needs the service of a nest nurse and better we get nursing today better this is going to be our 
healthcare infrastructure and ecosystem. So every single stakeholder, consumer, policymaker, industry representatives, patients, community, and especially all the nurses must join hands, advocate and canvas for this cause because we've seen what has happened to our country in the past year and, and so. So I think having great nurses back in this country is so much deserving, pay perks matter. So I'm sure this will happen. I'm very optimistic. I'm a person who's seen the revolution happening. It's an evolving phase. Every country has gone through this. We will also go through it and we will emerge stronger and we will see that things will get better for the nurses. Mr. Thank Jalan. You. No, thank you, Usha, and, and thank you, Swati. I think it is, like, like you said, that it's a very uh, complex issue and I think somewhere it is, it's like everyone is responsible for them. this. You know? So it's a very deep-rooted societal problem, if I may say. So there is a gender issue and, and what you, Usha, you said that, you know, the function itself is not viewed holistically. I'm just saying it's not labor, labor. You spoke about job cartel, which I think is, is absolutely the ground reality. There are people who actually would constantly feed you that that's what you deserve. I mean, you actually don't deserve more. And then, I mean, the new young let's say, fresh nurse, her own background where she has to, in a way, settle for whatever is available. So, so I think these are the ground realities. But, but again, I think whether you talk about nursing leaders, whether you talk about you know, the promoters of the hospital, you talk about policymakers, you talk about every other person, I think th there is a role which people have to play. And, and I think... Uh, and uh, I think there's every reason for us to be optimistic. I mean, we have we have been through uh, hell in this country and on various counts. And okay, this is one more challenge. I think I'm sure which would which is going to get addressed. Uh, my next question is, and I think we've again spoken about it, that nursing as a function actually has very little autonomy, has very little role in decision making people talk about you know that that uh, that you know they're they're hardly involved let's say when it comes to uh, design of a hospital it system you speak about procurement of consumables even the consumables which are largely used by nurses they have no role to play in fact ironically at times the nursing leaders are not even involved when it comes to decision making about nursing itself. So my question and this question, I'm going to ask each one of you, three of you, which is uh, Binu, Usha and Clora, that, I mean, how did, how did you address this? I mean, in your hospital and, and, you know, and because why I'm just saying is that that is something which is very fundamental. I mean, you know, getting uh, the right place, uh, getting the right uh, respect, you know, getting to a scenario where you're seen as an equal in, in an organogram kind of a piece. So, so let me let me start with you, uh, Binu. What is your take? Interesting uh, statement, uh, Mr. Jalan. It is difficult to in our country, difficult to find a seat in the boardroom, but. Usha, Clara, and me, all three of us in the practicing field, have the seat in the boardroom. And I would say, uh, I would not say it is by chance or it is by luck. We just discussed a strong leader, a competent leader, uh, somebody who's got all these uh, qualities. So you, as a nursing leader, uh, has to prove yourself that you are capable of getting a seat in the boardroom. I have been fortunate enough to work in two corporates and in both the corporates, we started from scratch and I was part of building the framework for the, for the chain of hospitals. And in the very beginning, I may have pushed my way through, but I did not accept 
any nursing decision if it was not run via me. So I would put across my point that uh, the decision makers had not involved and the people who took decisions probably did not know enough about these. Also, the, the lateral verticals in the hospital, a healthcare IT, choosing the consumables, which uh, nurses are the biggest user of the consumables, uh, working for, uh, for many other such things, the quality in the hospital, the audits. I think nurses are the largest users and if I would say they, uh, they take on the burden close to 99% when it comes to patient care and the 1% lies elsewhere. But if I may just quote, they take only the less than 1% of the salary, 99% goes elsewhere. That is the disparity in our country. So coming to the, to the boardroom, at times you have to push your way through wherever you are not involved and you feel it is going to impact your nursing team or it is going to impact your patient safety, patient outcomes or, or uh, patient advocacy is not going to be handled well, you can push your way through. But as I said, I was able to get the seat in the boardroom right since the beginning, but just getting the seat there is not the question. Are you able to do justice to your chair in the boardroom? Are you able to showcase to them evidence-based nursing, quality, reduce mortality, uh, reduce the extended length of stay, uh, less wastages of consumables, a better robust healthcare IT platform for doctors and nurses? Why I would say is I've been part of each and every vertical. Uh, whether it was choosing consumables or sitting across for designing the IT platform. And they could see the value. Nurses, as we said, more 75 nurses are women. They're all super women. They're all strong leaders. So if you have the ability to sustain the position and to get better and better. In our country, we have seen a lot of offshoots. Nurses are CEOs of the hospital, they are CEOs, they are director of the hospital. And even when they are, they are not holding those admin positions, they are just holding the nursing admin positions, they are showcasing themselves extremely well with their ability, with their expertise in the boardroom, and they are being quoted extremely well when it comes to a PNL sheet, a cost, the revenue, the cost of a procedure, how to define it. Nurses can do justice to that in the boardroom. So I don't think I needed to push much, so much to get the seat. But yes, you have to make a lot of sustained efforts to keep the seat going better and better. That's my take. Thank you so much. Flora, what would you say? That's, uh... I thought Mr. Jalan, you initially asked me that. Right. I think I did not face any problem as she has told, but as a assessor of NABH, when I had been to many hospitals, I still find the nursing leaders are struggling not to have any chair in the boardroom. They are not being in some of the important committees. The nurses are not invited to be in the decision making. So this is reality on the ground level. So I think India is very diverse and so is the healthcare and so is the nursing, nursing leadership positioning also in the organization. So what I would like to tell you is, as Binu rightly said, we need to demand. And what I would like to stress upon here to nursing leaders is make your absence felt. Make your absence felt in any meetings or in any decision or in any planning of the hospital. And I'm very sure nurses are highly capable involving in all these committees, whether it is the designing of the hospital or whether it is the management of materials or any other aspects. And I also would like to suggest that the nursing leaders are trying themselves to come forward. But I could see two scenarios across India. I'm not representing for my hospital because as Bilu said, we are positioned rightly 
and we are able to enjoy the complete liberty of taking complete decision for the nursing domain. However, there are people who don't have this liberty and I, we cannot blame uh, them for that because they probably are not given the right uh, environment or situation to express their talent. So probably COVID-like situation has have come in and I would say that every single nursing leader in the hospital where the leaders who were involved in COVID procurement of items, designing of COVID ICs, because only they stepped into the COVID ICOs, COVID wards. It's not even doctors first. So they were the people who were involved. So the hospital leaders and the institution have tasted and they have realized how good their nursing leaders are. Once they are brought into the boardroom, they will be able to make a decision. If not completely, at least they will give them the touch points which they have to be careful. Where will their wrong decisions be uh, if they are not cautioned? So the, such cautioning can be given by the nursing leaders. So what I would like to stress here for the nursing leaders here is, like whether you get an opportunity or not, as Binu said, you, we have to claim it. Mm -hmm. You can always walk in and say that this is what is the point I would like to stress here. Nursing is a domain. And when you're given an appointment order, you're a nursing director of a hospital, you have all the right. And nobody can question. As a nurse, when she takes patient safety as, a, as an important point to uh, uh, put her point in front of a consultant, we nursing leaders have to put a point that it is my right and my domain. So I have to be in the decision making because you cannot expect outcome. So this kind of competencies, probably we have to nurture among the young leaders and the leaders, those who are not having the right climate to project themselves. Another area which we have to think is having the grip on the ground. Some of our leaders, we will not have grip on the ground. We are not 360 degree competent on everything. For me too as well. So I learned what is supply chain and how do we, how do we plan the uh, um, reorder levels all these and then finance, financial planning for the hospital. These were the learning curve for nursing leaders. So I think some of our leaders are not interested to learn and evolve. So it's a wake up call for all of us. Those who are in that level, we need to wake up, understand beyond nursing so that people are inviting us into the boardroom and we showcase to them that we have the grip on the ground. And also it is important for us that we partake when an opportunity comes. When will we get an opportunity as a nursing leaders? In just uh, in the afternoon, we had a wonderful deliberation by Association of Nurse Executives India. The topic for discussion was uh, on error, reporting and learning. It was an empowered hour every month we conduct. You will not believe it gave a lot of eye-opening. When an error happens at the bedside, the boardroom is shaken. Who will be in the front will be the nursing leader. Take the opportunity there and then you can go on. It could be a product that has contributed to the error or a system or a policy or, or it may be many, many reasons. So catch from there and move on. Step into mortality, morbidity reviews, there we will get an opportunity. So we have to just see which is the loophole and then try to enter and then grab our seat, which is our right in the boardroom. That's it. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. And uh, I think we, we are running short of time. So if I were to just summarize what both of you said about nursing getting a role in the boardroom for that matter, I think you mentioned, I think, which is very important about demonstrating value you can bring to the table. And, and in fact, you, you put it very strongly that make your absence felt. It would require a lot of uh, relearning and learning. And something which you said that if you're not invited, gate crash. Because if you have a certain title, then it actually also makes you eligible, let's say, if I may use the word, 
uh, for a certain position, and you don't have to wait all the time for necessarily to be invited. I think so. I mean, the ter terrific point you made, and uh, I have just one last question, and uh, and uh, and I would request each one of you um, if you can just give me one word answer. And the question is, if there is only one thing you wished for the nursing profession in the country, what would that be? So, Usha. In one word, WHO declared 2020 as the year of the nurse. Let, it, let us make it as the era of the nurse for the days to come. True national heroes. Thank you. Antonia. I want the image of nursing to be changed because that is how we project ourselves. And I have a suggestion. Uh, you know, we are talking about only women, women in nursing, but also, you know, I dignified way I represent my male colleagues in the profession. So there should be equality in profession. This is what I want within and from the society for nursing. Absolutely. Uh, Binu. Transformed image of nursing in the society, among the authorities, in the private sector, among everyone. Thank you. Clara. Very long dream for me. I used to think like there the it's not just the competency, we need also numbers. So if every family, one person comes forward, get inspired to become a nurse, what more we now want in India? That is what we want to see very soon. And that will happen because this webinar is a great, great, great initiative that is helping us to realize. So this is a beautiful dream, Clara. It's like some of the countries speak about that how every family has to contribute one member for the army. You know, it's like it's like you know you must know what your country is all about. Swati, your last word. Uh, I would say asking questions courageously, not getting scared whether he's a CEO or he's a minister or he's the prime minister. That is one. Second thing is that the nursing curriculum should have gender equity and the knowledge about labor laws to the nurses. And the third thing is that the structural issues at the national level and at the state level, and especially Indian Nursing Council should change the president. We are having the same president for so many years. And after the nursing council is abolished, still we are having him. So I think that part should get deleted and we should bring new faces with new knowledge, with voice. The nursing bill should be autonomous bill. It should have only nursing leaders in that. We don't want doctors. Thank you very much. If you want us, take us in your bill, in your commission. We will join you. You join us. That's it. So thank you so much. And Swati spoke about courage. She spoke about uh, uh, education policy. She actually spoke about under nurses understanding within course their rights and you know how they need to play a role in decision making. We spoke about the image of nursing and Usha said, why can't this be the era of nursing? So I think thank you everyone and, uh, and since the participant had a few questions, I think uh, uh, there is only one question because we just don't have the time. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but what we would do uh, afterwards is take all the questions and, and obviously get back to you uh, through a mail and also respond to the people who have asked those questions, just to be fair. So there's only one question which uh, I thought I'll ask uh, um, one of you, maybe Clara could answer that. And, and the question is that since the vast majority of the hospitals, uh, for right or wrong reasons, let's say, tend to focus on the business side, you know, the revenues and the expenses and all of that. Is part of the problem with nursing leadership is their inadequate understanding of business matters? I can take out some part. If anybody else wants to come before me, that's okay. Yeah, Usha, yeah, please. Uh, well, I think we should be very, very candid. Um, today's uh, largely the country is served by the private healthcare and the corporate healthcare sector. That's how 
the health of the country is poised at. And I think uh, you're rightly saying, or whoever's asked this question has asked the right question. It's important for nurses to not only be clinically competent and socially sensitive and ethically engaged, they must bring in competence and knowledge about industry and business. If you don't do that, you really don't succeed in the profile that you hold. And there's no point in lamenting and beating others around. It is for us to rise. And it's very, very important to thrive. Binu, you have something to add here. Uh, so I would just add that, as Usha just spoke, that private sector manages most of the healthcare in India and private sector is very, very conscious of profit making. It's a business ultimately. And nursing, because the numbers are very high, it is considered a cost center. And uh, the nursing leaders, unfortunately, are not trained in financials. So when you become a leader, either the organization trains you to understand p &L sheet, the cost, the revenue, and the financials overall. And uh, if they don't train you, then you train yourself. But it is important to understand the financials. It is important to understand and appreciate the fact the hospital has to sustain itself. But that cannot be at the cost of just cutting down on nursing numbers or, or not taking up the nursing salaries. There are so many other departments. There are so many other people taking salaries. There are fat, fat packages being given to the business leaders, so-called. I should not be putting that in uh, stark real words. But nursing brings in quality. They bring in patient safety. They enhance the image of the hospital, even though they carry a certain cost. That cost is so minuscule. If you look at the percentile of the cost of the hospital month on month or for the year. But nursing leaders have to understand the financials to speak up so that they can add value and get more investment for nursing in the hospital they are working. Thank you so much. So uh, let me conclude what you're saying is that, uh, to be honest, uh, quite a few nursing leaders don't actually have uh, adequate understanding of business side of it. It's very crucial. And somebody has to make it happen. And quite frankly, I would imagine, like any other organization, it's not just healthcare. I mean, you talk about banking, you talk about telecom, you talk about Unilever. You know, there are companies which actually invest in building, creating leaders. So I think it is the organization we should invest, but somebody has to. I mean, and in some cases, maybe you have to take the ownership to train yourself for your own interest and for your, the company's interest. So I think that is very, very crucial. So with this, uh, uh, let me conclude the panel discussion. And I think, thank you so very much. And Honestly, uh, forget anybody else. I feel infinitely more optimistic after this. That, you know, I'm just saying uh, the world will change. And I think what Usha said that, you know, uh, it is going to be an era of nursing. What we are saying that, you know, you talk about image, we talk about, you know, I mean, many other things. In fact, I'll just say two things. I mean, I, I have often said in public platforms that the marketing budget typically is little more than what nursing gets paid. And the best thing you could do is to give some of the marketing budget to nursing. And that is going to be even more effective ways of marketing. But somebody has to understand that. And uh, I have a young daughter who has told me once that any woman who wants to be like a man lacks ambition. So I think, I think, you know, uh, the fact that, and, 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 you know, I'm just saying, I think we spoke about uh, us using the word sisters. So I think I'm, I'm quite, uh, uh, let's say, cognizant of the fact that you have a sizable number of nurses who are males. But the reason why we use that word was that we often talk about brotherhood. That, you know, I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's a community of people, I'm just saying, and could be any profession, any geography, any ethnicity, any cause, 
and you form a brotherhood you are there with each other you are there to you know nurture support defend other people so i think it was in that context we use the expression not really to 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 focus on the gender piece so thank you all very much for finding time saturday afternoon and all i can assure you that it is only the beginning because i think th this one panel discussion can honestly other than maybe creating some ripples here and there it cannot achieve much so i think we have to continue the discussion but more importantly we actually have to have some specific action items so i think you know i mean how do we actually create a very healthy pipeline of nursing leadership i mean do you have a role to play there the honest answer is absolutely yes but we have to work towards that we also have to work towards getting nursing recognition so i'm actually you know jumping two steps ahead i mean today we talk about jci we talk about nabh and usha you know that you know apollo hospital we were the first ones to bring jci into the country if you talk about the us you have the magnet recognition for nursing am i right i'm just saying today if you talk about the us news magazine when they talk about best hospital when they talk about cleveland clinic mayo hopkins stanford or harvard magnet recognition is a pretty important criteria can we get that to the country so i'm just saying we are talking about also the need to take to take some specific steps whether you talk about i mean you have millions of awards in the country for best upcoming physician not so upcoming physician north zone south zone gynec obstetrician you know hair hair i mean hair beauty god knows how many fertility but i'm just saying i'm yet to see nursing getting recognized you know i mean you talk about ci and fiki and shm you talk about two day healthcare conference i've never ever seen somebody mm -hmm. from nursing so i think we need to get them their place we need to get them recognized we need to work towards build, you know we need to work towards building the nursing leadership pipeline we need to uh, you know work towards you know work environment for that matter so i think it is it is a beginning i'm sure we're going to work together i would require lot more support from you all and i think lot many of you all you know us being in this journey so thanks thank you so much and it was great having you and i must also thank uh, all the participants who who actually chose to join us on a saturday evening it just shows their passion and their commitment thanks so much and have a great weekend thank you mr jalan and i would thank just you. add to mr jalan's thing that uh, 80% of healthcare is private and if we really want to negotiate we have to bring unions nursing unions and nursing lobbyists in the next future absolutely. and that's how i end it absolutely thank you so much thank you so much dr thank, thank you mr jalan thank you so much thank you everyone thank you thank you, thank you. Bye.